Hello, my name is Petra Lewis. I'm a, a professor of radiology and OBGYN and vice chair of education in radiology at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center and, and uh, Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth. And this talk is really all about how you can use some evidence-based memory and learning techniques to improve either your teaching if you're an instructor or your learning. And um, I am going to use a lot of examples from the medical literature, and um, this is particularly focused on medical education, but it does apply to multiple other specialties. I'd like you, first of all, just to take a moment to read these learning objectives. And these two. Before I start talking about these various concepts that I've listed here to do with memory and learning, I want you to know that these are not independent variables. And so many of the times in using both uh, examples I'm going to use for both learning and for teaching, you're using multiple um, different concepts in the same process, even though in the research literature, they often get studied independently. These concepts not only apply to whether you're a learner or you're an instructor, but they apply equally if you're a kindergarten learning a new skill or if you're, perhaps you're a retired person who's learning a skill for the first time. And they not only apply to cognitive skills, um, but they apply to sports, motor skills, um, skills that require fine motor coordination. And in my case, hopefully they'll also apply to me learning how to parallel park this summer. But this, a lot of that I'm talking about is not new science. Um, it's been around for um, 100 or so years, and in some cases, some of it's been around for several thousand years. But interestingly, it's been very slow to come to medical education. And at the end, we're going to circle back to why pi has anything to do with this topic. I'm going to start with some just very basic memory concepts that many of you may be quite aware of, but I think they um, bear going over again. Our memory can be divided into two different components, working memory, uh, which was previously called short-term memory, and long-term memory. And these two different components work together to help us both store and retrieve memories. To be able to store memories, first of all, have to encode them. And encoding is when we take sensory impulses, so this is something perhaps we're reading, something we're listening to, a motor skill that we're learning, into some kind of a form that your brain can actually store or memorize. Once the memories have been encoded, they are then consolidated within the brain. And consolidation involves this new information being combined with prior information and also this memory being reorganized. And so to put this graphically, as we're encoding, we're adding information or adding pennies to our book here. We're consolidating it into larger groups of information or dollar bills in this case. And then retrieval is when we come to either take out the information in isolated parts like pennies or in larger groups of information, such as taking dollars out of the bank. And memories can be said to be available if they have been stored in your brain, but they're only accessible if we can retrieve them. And this is often the issue. It's getting the pennies out of the bank, retrieving the memories that is problematic. I've talked before about brain-friendly teaching, and that is finding methods that reduce the cognitive load and will help in the process of encoding. As I said, as information gets coded, it gets encoded into the brain. It then gets consolidated into larger groups of information um, and combined with prior information. And then at some point, we retrieve this information. As we retrieve our memories, we add new information to it, which then gets encoded again and it gets reconsolidated. And this circle continues uh, during the learning process. Our working memory is totally immersed in our learning environment. And there's a lot of different things within that learning environment that can affect how well we encode that information. So distractions, prior experience, whether we're paying any attention or not, the context, whether we're tired, whether we're interested in it, as well as cognitive load, which I mentioned just now. My daughter, who's a beekeeper, drew this lovely diagram for me to try and demonstrate this. She said that if you're thinking about the pollen, as being the new information which the bees are trying to encode, um, they're part of the working memory into honey in your long-term memory, your long-term memories uh, sitting there. There are a lot of distractions and other things in the environment that can affect this encoding or this pollen storage process. Oh, that was a cute diagram. It turns out that one of the things that can affect our ability to um, learn things effectively is sleeping. 
And sleeping is crucial to us to being able to memorize information. And in fact, there's a very systematic way that our brain seems to deal with information. First of all, it starts off being consolidated in the hippocampus, and then it gets moved to the cortex for storage, and then it gets rehearsed and reorganized within the cortex. And these things happen in later sleep. They mostly happen in non-REM sleep, um, but some types of memory storage may happen in REM sleep. Here's a study that showed the effect of sleep. In this study, the subjects were learning a motor task. They learned it at 10 a.m. of day one here. They then uh, were tested again at 10 p.m., 12 hours later, and there was no significant um, improvement in their ability to do this motor task. They then went to bed. They did not uh, try it again until the next morning at 10 a.m., and lo and behold, there was now a significant improvement in the speed that they could do this motor task, which is you know, kind of interesting. Their brain uh, rehearsed it during the night and they got up the next morning and lo and behold, they could do this task better. So what happens if we are sleep deprived? Well, uh, we all know that we don't learn well when we're sleep deprived, but here's a nice study that showed it. Again, it was a motor task that they learned on day one. There were then six different sets of subject, five sets of subjects, went to bed um, um, all the way through the uh, period of the study. And they were either tested on day one, two, three, four, or five. Five different sets of subjects. They went tested five times. And all of them had significantly improved um, speed despite having not practiced it in between times. The sixth study group, however, were not allowed to sleep here between day zero and day one. They weren't tested on days one and two, and they were allowed to sleep between days one and two and days two and three. So by the time they were tested on day three, which is the black bars here, they were well rested, but you can see they performed really badly the task. So the fact that here they were sleep deprived meant that that sleep deprivation prevented them from learning this task properly. And so the other day three individuals, as you can see, did much, much better. To be able to learn information effectively, we have to have some kind of a context or framework that makes sense to us um, before this new information comes in. If I asked you to learn a whole series of sentences like this that don't make much sense, it would be very difficult for you. It would be very difficult for you if I tested you the next day to uh, listen to us. Um, just have a think about it and have a think whether it makes any sense to you. But what about if I shoot with this picture? Now, all of a sudden, there's a context for this sentence. And if I tested you the next day after seeing a series of these strange sentences, but within a picture that put it into context, you would remember them much better. Here's another example. This was a study which took a, a written description of a baseball innings, a very detailed description of this innings, like a radio commentary. The, this was then shown to two sets of, of groups of individuals. One group of individuals had never um, shown any interest in baseball at all. They were like me. They don't know one end of a bat from the other. They never watched sport. The second group of individuals are baseball fans. When they asked the baseball fans what they remembered from the, the written description of the innings, they, they knew all the details. They knew all the plays and the scores and the hits. And you know, as you can see, I don't know anything about this. Um, the other group of individuals who were the Petra-like people, um, they talked about the weather and the, the outfits that people had on and when the crowd cheered really loudly and so on, because they had no context. So all this stuff about battings and innings, maybe again, cricket and um, baseball muddled up then, didn't make any sense and they had no context so they couldn't memorize it. And this is important for us to know when we teach or when we're learning. So um, some of you may recognize this is Bloom's Taxonomy of Learning. Benjamin Bloom was an educational psychologist back in the 1950s, and he developed this pyramid or taxonomy of learning objectives. And when we're trying to teach, we're often wanting to develop in our learners these sort of upper level skills. The American Board of Radiology, for example, when we're putting exams together, wants us to make questions, which are sort of 80 or 90 percent are testing these upper level skills. The problem is, if you don't have a base to this pyramid, if you don't have some lower level skill, some framework of understanding, it's very difficult for um, learners to be able to apply those lower learning skills. And I sort of learned this when I was a 
uh, medical student resident that I found that I had to read a very basic textbook or a basic chapter about a subject before I could read the much more detailed one. If not, I just kind of couldn't absorb any of it. So if you have a pre-existing memory framework about something shown here by the white blocks, that new information shown by the colored blocks as it comes into your mind and gets encoded has something to attach to. But if you don't have that pre-existing framework, then it's much more challenging. This new information has nothing to attach to and you run the risk that you're going to lose an awful lot of it. These frameworks I was talking about are also called memory schema. So a schema is a framework or a pattern within your brain that allows incoming information to be stored very efficiently and retrieved very efficiently. And part of the process of us developing from being novices to experts within a subject is the development of these schema. To put this in a graphical way, um, a novice memory schema who has never seen Santa Claus before may have to analyze every single item in perhaps a fairly linear fashion um, of the picture to be able to come up with the diagnosis, if you like, of Santa Claus. But an expert memory schema works very differently. We, each of the components are interrelated and it can perhaps just hear the laugh and immediately know that that is Santa Claus or see the presence in the sack and know that Santa Claus without having to have um, a linear process in, in, in analyzing this picture. To aid in the process of developing a memory schema, we do what's called chunking. And chunking is taking individual small pieces of information and grouping them together into larger units. And this helps us both store information efficiently and more particularly, it helps us retrieve information much more efficiently later. So if we were learning the colors of the rainbow rather than learning them as individual series of colors, we might chunk them together into the rainbow itself and see that as our picture that we recall. Uh, we chunk numbers all the time, our credit card numbers. This is not my credit card number. So those of you uh, watching, um, don't bother writing it down. Um, maybe somebody's credit card number, but it's not mine. Um, we divide them into blocks of four digits because it's much easier to store and memorize those and also to recall them later. And we do the same with phone numbers. That's why phone numbers are not just written as a single 10 digit stream, but are linked, are blocked up into three, three and four digits because it chunks them, helps us remember them much better. Priming can best be described as an unconscious memory effect that we see, we hear, or we feel something that then affects how we respond to something else. So a, a simple example would be if I showed you a slide that just was colored yellow, and then I asked you a few seconds later to name a fruit, you'd be more likely to say banana or lemon than you would perhaps to say something like a lime or an orange. And priming gets used in advertising all the time without us realizing it. So, for example, you might be watching uh, American Idol and you're not consciously noting the Coca-Cola cups sitting on their desk. But um, half an hour later, when you're feeling thirsty and you go to the fridge, you see Coca-Cola sitting there, you're more likely to pick it up than you are the, the um, carton of orange juice. Here's a study which showed this. It was kind of interesting. They had a supermarket and uh, for a week in the supermarket, they played German music and for a week in the supermarket, they played French music. And then they looked at how much French or German wine was sold. And um, they found that they sold a lot more German wine with a German music playing and French wine with a French music playing. And, I, you know, the, again, it was an unconscious effect. I don't think the shoppers were walking around listening to the umpa bar and saying, oh, I need to go and buy some Liebfraumilch. I like to think of priming as almost being a warm-up exercise for the brain. So how can we use priming in teaching? One way is to provide our learners with their learning objectives and actually get them to read it. This helps them gear up their brain for the information they're about to receive. Pre-testing does the same thing by giving a very short quiz at the beginning of a session on the content that you're about to teach. Again, lines up their brain for the information that they're going to get in. And studies have shown that providing these short pre-quizzes, even if they get the questions wrong, helps tell their brain in some way, wow, you know, okay, that's the answer to the question that I was given at the beginning. Obviously, you have to make sure the questions are answered. Memory cues are another type of priming. 
So what are memory cues or memory hooks as I like to think of them? So these are uh, stimuli that help you retrieve memories. And so they can be related to any sense. It might be a, a smell or a picture or a word or a group of words that helps you retrieve a large body of information by exposure to that stimulus. These are most effective if you learn these memory cues or you attach these memory cues at the time that you store the information, you encode it rather than in a later time. Here's some example of memory cues, mnemonics. Mnemonics are memory cues. I mean, you know, no radiologist can remember the ossification centers of the elbow if we didn't have the mnemonic crito um, to remember them by. We can help provide cues by signaling in lectures, making sure that certain words or phrases are clearly highlighted on our slides or verbally reinforced. Visual cues seem to be better than verbal cues, and the more vivid something is, or the more graphical representation, um, the better. And the more personal it is to you, that particular memory cue, the better it's going to work. So in this talk, a memory cue for um, what I was discussing about memory frameworks might be that graphic that I showed you before would help you retrieve that information. And these memory cues work along with chunking and memory schemas to enable not just one single piece of information to be pulled out with a memory cue, but perhaps several pieces of information or a very large group of information that is all related in our memory schema. Now let's come back now to medical education. So how is a lot of medical school and also postgraduate learning done? Well, an awful lot is done by people sitting in uh, classrooms or lecture halls and being given didactic lectures. Um, often they're given the same information multiple times during residency or during medical schools in different forms. And we often go to multiple CME lectures and hear the same sort of information year after year. An awful lot is done like this as well, either reading online or um, hard copy resources. Um, this student quite, didn't quite get the idea about uh, highlighting, it seems. And we read them again and again. And this kind of studying is called repeated review. And there's some problems with repeated review. For one thing, you may become very familiar with the text, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, that our learners understand the text, they understand the concepts of it, or they can apply it in a different situation. And this is called the illusion of false mastery, that you're, you think you know it just because you can kind of spout it all out or parrot it all out. So this has been shown to be a fairly effective way of um, cramming for exams, so um, binge and purge type of learning, but it's not been effective for long-term learning. I remember walking out of my um, physics board, so radiology back whenever, um, and actually getting this visual image of flushing this old-fashioned British toilet and all of that information just kind of washing down the drain, and I'm pretty sure that's what actually happened. So if you think that repeated review is an effective way of learning, then just take a look at these images here. Um, it shows six different faces of the head side of a penny, which I'm sure you've seen multiple times. And so try and guess which one is correct without looking at um, the coins in your pocket. Just give you a sec there. And I can tell you this one is correct, B. So uh, if repeated review works so well, you should have all got that right. So how soon do we forget? Well, I don't often show dead white guys in my lectures, but I thought I'd show this one. Um, this, this is a doctor called Hermann Ebenhauser. He was a psychologist back in the latter half of the 19th century, and he performed a lot of interesting experiments in this area, which have been repeated uh, many hundreds of times over. Since then, um, he performed most experiments on himself, interestingly. IRB boards not being quite what they were back then. Um, one of his classic experiments, he learnt a whole series of um, random uh, syllables like this. So none of them made any sense. None of them made words. They were all just three um, letter groupings. So he would learn a series of these, and then he would test himself to see um, a period of time on to see how many he could remember. And then he would learn a new grouping and test himself a different time on to see how many he could remember. And this is the classic 
Ebenhauser um, forgetting curve. And this, as I say, has been reproduced in multiple different things other than just random syllables since. And it's pretty scary, really. I mean, you know, 20 minutes later, you know, you, you've just got your cup of coffee and you've gone back to your workstations as residents and um, you've already forgotten half of it, you know, an hour later, a bit more. You know, if I ask you tomorrow, you only remember maybe a third of what what you learned. So this is kind of depressing. We spent a lot of time teaching our learners and our learners spent an awful lot of time um, studying and uh, going to lectures. Um, and yet a month later, they're down to only a fifth. And he actually developed a formula for this. So basically, if we want people to retain more information, it's either got to be uh, testing them closer to the time they learned it, or we need to increase the strength of the memory. And we're going to talk more about that. In another experiment, he did a slightly different way. He tested how increasing the complexity of the material that he's learning was, um, would affect the forgetting curve. So he did this a little bit different. Um, in this time, what he would do is he would learn different number of syllables. You can see here going from the green 12 syllables to the yellow 36 syllables. And then he would uh, review them, do a sort of repeated review on the sequential days to see how many times he had to um, repeat them um, before he got them right. And you can see, as you might expect, that the more uh, the larger the number of syllables he had to learn, the more complicated the information, the more times that he had to repeat them before he remembered them. And by the time he got sort of a long way out, it was all about the same. Now, look at the blue line. The blue line here was eight lines of poetry, which has a lot more syllables in 36. But this was much easier, it turned out, to memorize. And that's because it has context that we talked about before. The nonsense syllables are just abstract information, much more difficult to learn. So does this apply to doctors? Well, here was an interesting experiment that it took some um, 80, I think, doctors who were um, between a year and 50 odd years out from medical school. And they were given a basic science exam, a bit of a nightmare. I think I'm not sure I'd want to volunteer for that study. Um, and the information in the exam was all stuff that they should have been taught at medical school, um, even 50 years ago. Um, after they answered the question, they were asked, well, do you think you ever learned this information? Did you come across it at medical school? Um, and if so, have you come across it and had to apply it since? So, you know, maybe if you were an intensive care doctor, you might have used some physiology um, material and so on. This is the results from the information which they felt they had not come across since. And as you can see, although it's a much more noisy curve, it does basically follow the same Ebenhaus forgetting pattern. So how can we interrupt this forgetting? Well, Aristotle seemed to know several thousand years ago, um, and he said this, an exercise in repeatedly recalling a thing strengthens the memory. So that's that increasing that S and hence increasing that R value that we showed before. And one way to do this is what's called spaced repetition in the educational literature, but you might better know it as testing or testing yourself or just plain old remembering. And here's what happens with spaced repetition. So here we are with our Ebenhauser curve. We just learned something the once. However, if we're forced to recall that information through some sort of a testing process fairly soon after we've learned it, perhaps the next day, we'll then get back to where we were and then the curve is shallower. Forced to recall it again a little bit later on and shallower again and so on. So by doing this, you can eventually retain sort of 90 to 100 percent of the information rather than that 20 percent that we talked about before. Here's an example from the medical education literature um, by a gentleman called Kerfoot, who has uh, performed a number of these type of experiments. And this was a pretty large experiment involving um, 762 urology residents. And they were learning urohistopathology. And they had slides either related to pathology in the prostate or pathology in the kidneys. And they were um, randomized to two groups. One group, they used spaced repetition um, to keep being tested about this information. And the other group were just using um, repeated review type web modules. Um, and all the information was uh, given to them in a web module. 
And what they did was they found that the spaced repetition group increased their long-term learning efficiency fourfold over the group that just got to review the material, which is a really significant increase. So one question that has arisen is, well, if we're doing spaced interval testing, um, is it important that the time between testing episodes is an increasing interval? So perhaps one, one day, one week, two weeks, a month, three months, and so on. Or can it be the same interval? So could it be that you test yourself once a week and so on? Um, I think the jury's out on this a little bit. Um, here's one experiment that seems to suggest that the increasing interval helps. Um, this is a study where they had to learn Japanese-English word pairs, um, and one cohort were tested at, um, it had uh, space interval testing at the same intervals, and that's the one shown in blue here, and the other one it was increasing intervals shown in red here. And I think when you look at this here, it's clear that the, at least the early part of the study that the red, the increasing interval, had the um, record a greater proportion. By the end, perhaps only a tiny bit, but if you think that your exam might be happening during this time, perhaps you're best doing the increasing interval rather than the same interval. So what's happening with spaced interval testing? Well, I kind of like to think about it like this. The first time you store a memory, you've just learned it the once, you know, it's somewhere in there, it's somewhere in the forest of your mind, but it's kind of difficult to find. The path to it is very, very faint. But each time we're forced to remember or recall that information or were tested on that information, that path gets clearer and clearer and clearer. So eventually there's no getting lost. We can recall that information very easily. One thing that seems to be important is that we need to allow a little forgetting time. So just sort of reading the information, immediately testing yourself on the information, or you go through those um, web modules and there's some multiple choice questions at the end, um, that doesn't really help. Um, it really doesn't help for long-term memory. So you've got to allow a little forgetting. You've got to make your brain work a little harder. So a few hours or testing the next day to allow that sleep consolidation to go on. Um, it, by allowing little time, you're increasing the effort of recall. And this is called a desirable difficulty. And desirable difficulties are something that has been shown to improve learning. And I kind of think about it in the same way as, you know, if, if, you're, if you're wanting to increase the strength of your muscle at the gym, then going in and just kind of picking up a two pound barbell is probably not going to do it. You're going to kind of make that muscle work a little bit. And it's all the same in the brain. So what are desirable difficulties? Well, a desirable difficulty might be testing before we teach. We already talked about that in the context of priming. But, you know, it's more difficult to answer a question when you haven't been taught the information and you're really kind of dredging out what you knew about it or you came across it in clinic, perhaps. Allowing that forgetting time, so forgetting and then remembering it. Testing some of the higher level learning skills, such as application or integration or creating um, information rather than just pure recall. When we do tests, a multiple choice test is much easier because there's recognition in there than a fill in the blank type where you actually have to fill in that word. Um, having to reply with a complete sentence is more difficult. Having to write an essay is more difficult than that, although we don't often use that in medical education. So before I come back to some more teaching and learning techniques that may be helpful, I just want to talk about how we might put um, some of the theories we've talked about, priming, memory cues, space repetition, desirable difficulties into practice. So in teaching, we can provide learning objectives in advance. It's going to do a couple of things. It's going to help with priming. And it's going to give us the, our learners the opportunity, if they know absolutely nothing about this subject, for example, their first year residence, and perhaps this is a higher level um, lecture you're going to be given, to be able to do some reading and help develop that knowledge framework. We can give a quick content, a content test at the session start, again, helping with priming, but also introducing a desirable difficulty. We can include some vivid memory cues to help our learners retain that information. And then we can test them in some form or make them recall the information. We can do it at the session end, but as I talked about just now, it's probably not the most effective time. But we could send out some questions by email the next day 
and then send them out some answers. Ask them to, they don't necessarily have to return them to you, but at least have them think about the information and try and recall it before they look at the answers. And then you could go at the start of your next lecture, perhaps the next month, you could test them on the information you taught them on the last lecture. It is really important, however, in all of these things that they do have corrective feedback. Um, we just had a whole load of e-learning modules at my institution, painfully plowed our way through hours and hours of these. And there were a number of um, tests at the end of the modules where you passed, you got 80%, but they never told you the answer to the ones you got wrong, which was really frustrating. And by consequence, I still don't know the answers to them. If you're a learner, you can do the same thing. You learn, you maybe study one type of information one day, and then you test yourself on that information the next day before you learn some new information a week later, a month later, and so on. What kind of retrieval practice, AKA testing, can you do? Well, quizzes, um, always helpful. Multiple choice quizzes, obviously are very popular, seeing as they correspond to uh, many of the medical school exams. And you can certainly use audience response for this quite effectively. You know, as we said, it's not the most, um, the less challenging than some other forms, but they are a useful tool. You can get learners to do summary exercises, or as a learner, you can make yourself do these. So um, ask them to write down before they leave the lecture hall the three uh, things that they um, remember, the most th five key points from your lecture and so on, have them write it down, um, or have them do it at the beginning of your next lecture. Um, case review sessions for us as radiologists are very important. We're applying those skills as our simulations. And, you know, let's not forget the old flashcards. Flashcards are a very effective testing tool. Um, and now, as well as the old uh, traditional hard copy format, there are some very useful digital formats. One way that you can combine flashcards and spaced repetition, either electronic or hard copy, is using something called a Leitner box. And um, in this system, you have three boxes of flashcards. Box number one, you review the most often. Box number two, the next most often. And then box number three, the least frequent. As you um, answer the questions in each box, if you get a question wrong, then it moves um, up into box number one. If you get a question right, it moves down to the next most frequently reviewed box. So just to show you here. Um, there are a variety of software um, applications out there that are both apps or run on your PC slash Mac, um, which you can use for spaced repetition. And all of these have um, that ability within them. So they're worth checking out. They work very well. You put the information in and they will deliver it to you in a time period that you're asking. Interestingly, the American Board of Radiology has, is changing how it does uh, maintenance certification. And instead of big exams, we're now going to be given what's effectively spaced repetition questions. I'm going to move on here to talk about four other learning concepts, and then we'll talk about some, uh, we'll have some examples of how we might apply these. These include generation and elaboration and interweaved and varied practice. So let's start with generation and elaboration. So the generation effect is that information is better remembered if you have to generate it from your mind, you have to force yourself to recall it, then you simply read it. Here's a study that showed this. Um, in this study, um, the volunteers, there were two sets of volunteers, were shown a number of word pairs. And the words were associated in some way. So they were associated because they rhymed with each other or in the same group, such as they were all vegetables or they were synonyms and so on. And I'm showing group data here um, between the whole word pairs. Now, one cohort in this study um, just read these word pairs. They were just written there, they read them, and then they were tested on them. In the second cohort, um, they were given the first word, but they were just given a letter or two of the second one. So say the word pair was doctor, nurse, um, they were given doctor dash N or something or other. So they had to generate at least the majority of that information in that word pair. And then for the final test, they were all given the first word and then a range of options for the second word for both groups. As you can see here, the group that had to generate the information initially when they learned it, 
um, learnt much more than the group that simply read it. So how might we use this generation effect to improve our learning? Well, we can improve our learning by attempting the solution before the learning occurs. That's what I talked about at the beginning with pre-testing, for example. By attempting the solution before you Google it, right? Make your brain work a little hard for that. Fill in the blank type questions or summaries. All of these, you're generating information. Multiple choice and not a form of generation. They've been shown that if you repeat the information out loud to yourself after you've learned it, um, that that improves um, memorization um, if you don't get arrested on the subway. Um, drawing it, I often get the residents to draw out an abnormality they're talking about or trying to describe. Um, and then reflection and rehearsal exercises. Um, just talk about those a little bit. So reflection, a reflection exercise, and I am... You know, I'm no big yoga person here, so this is my type of reflection. But thinking through, you know, how did I miss that case? How did I get that diagnosis wrong, you know, for radiologists? What was I looking at the CT that made me think it was something else or not see it at all? You know, identifying how you might do that differently if a similar case um, occurred. Um, rehearsal is thinking in advance. So how am I going to do this procedure? How am I going to examine this patient? How am, I, how am I going to do this surgery? Mentally walking through each step and identifying the potential errors that might occur at any step. And this is used extensively um, by pilots, for example, um, as part of their flight training. Self-explanations are another form of generation. So I use this a lot with the, the students and the residents. So I asked them, you know, how did you get to the answer? What kind of paradigm did you use? What theory were you applying when you came up with that diagnosis? And, you know, there's a couple of important things here. One, you often find out that um, they got the answer right for the wrong reason, which is important. You can correct them there. Um, but self-generations in themselves have been shown to improve learning. Even if they got the answer wrong, the mere act of kind of walking through that process and then being corrected or correcting themselves seems to aid learning. Um, I often get them to teach another learner, either somebody at the same level or perhaps, you know, if they're a resident, teach a student that concept. Um, if you have two learners who have different answers for an exercise, then getting them to convince the other one that their answer is correct, again, um, strengthens the learning. So what about elaboration? So elaboration is when you try and make something that otherwise would not be meaningful, meaningful to you so that you can remember it. So some things are more memorable than others. We already talked about those random syllables um, that, you know, they had, there was no meaning attached to them. So numbers are not memorable because they have no meaning for the vast majority of us. The same as abstract words. An abstract word uh, might be a word in a different language that you don't know, as well as something like those random syllables Ebbinghaus used. Meaningful words are still not as memorable as images, and meaningful images are more memorable than abstract images. An interesting study that looked at the process of elaboration was the Baker-Baker study. So in this study, the uh, testees were given a picture of a face and a word associated with it. One cohort of subjects were given the uh, profession of the subject. The other cohort were given the name of the subject. And these were made to overlap like this, Mr. Baker or A. Baker. For the follow-up testing, they were given the face and they had to put the correct word with it. And the cohort of subjects that were given the profession remembered far more of the correct profession than those who just were given it as a name. So what happens is when we're told that this guy is a baker as opposed to just being called Mr. Baker, is we see him kind of, you know, subconsciously in his bakery, in his, in his white baker's uniform with the hat, um, and we see the bread that he's making and so on. So we elaborate this extra information that becomes much more memorable. So how can we elaborate as we're learning? Well, we can connect new information with prior knowledge. So we can have it make sense according to something we already know by relating it to a prior experience in some way. We can find common themes between different elements of information. And what this is doing is it's really helping us build our memory schema. So for example, in radiology, um, perhaps we already know that um, we know about angiomyolipomas, a type of renal tumor, um, and we know what it looks like on CT. 
And then we go to ultrasound and we're finding out that this is an angiomyelopoma in ultrasound or this is an angiomyelopoma on an MRI scan. So we can elaborate by connecting it back to our prior information about a CT so we can have a thing. Well, you know, I know that it has a CT, uh, on a CT it has fat inside it, that this is the density of fat, the same as the fat here. So let me think, well, on an ultrasound, here's fat here on an ultrasound, and here's the fat here looking echogenic um, in the angiomyelipoma and similar on the MRI. So we're connecting it with what we already know. And we already know a lot about stuff. We, you know, the chances are we know something already we can connect it to in that memory framework. Here's another example of elaboration. Uh, this came from a class I was teaching with very junior first year medical students and I showed them this abdominal radiograph and I just asked them, is this radiograph taken with a patient standing up or lying down? Only a third got it right and it turned out that the third had completely guessed. So I wanted them to try and work this out rather than just telling them the answer. And to do this, I had them elaborate onto something that was much more familiar. So I got one of the students to, first of all, stand up with a water bottle and told the others that she has a loop of dilated bowel um, as represented by the water bottle and then lie down with it and say, well, if you are the x-ray beam looking at this person, um, what is the difference between these two studies? And immediately they got it. And hopefully in future, when they're looking at an abdominal radiograph, they will remember this exercise and immediately be able to elaborate the information. So in elaboration, we'd, we may want to make the abstract real. So some kind of a visual or verbal construct of abstract information. So such as uh, converting names or numbers into an image or a sentence. Um, I'm gonna to touch briefly on memory palaces or the method of loci that uses this technique. So here is a nice strong 10 digit um, password. Um, this is not my current password. So again, don't write that down. Um, but how can I elaborate that so I can remember it? Well, I happen to be a dressmaker. So I can elaborate that into a sentence which I can remember. So memory palaces or method of loci use this form of elaboration to turn abstract information into some sort of visual representation. Anyone who's seen the excellent British TV series, Sherlock Holmes, will know that Sherlock Holmes uses these. And the the Greeks use these to memorize huge volumes of uh, information as part of their um, verbal histories that they handed on to the next generation. And people use these who take part in memory championships, um, but they can also be used for a lot more useful things. Uh, here's one example of what might be a very simple memory palace. Um, the memory palace can be anywhere you like. In this case, it's somebody's home and they're remembering a shopping list by providing visual representations. Um, I recommend that you buy the book uh, Moonwalking with Einstein if you're, more, if you're interested in more of this topic. So I really don't have time to go into it during this current lecture. So how can we use generation elaboration as part of self-testing? Well, when you read something or you see a... Um, you hear it during a lecture or you're reading it during a module, ask yourself these questions. Do I really understand what this means? You know, what are the basic concepts in this text? Can I write a quick summary of it and, and write it? Um, can you explain it to somebody else? How does it relate to information I already know? Draw it out. Um, the final concepts I want to talk about are interleaved and variable practice. So blocked or mass practice is if you do the same process or you see the same process over and over again. So very similar areas. So in a radiology example, it might be that you're learning about left lower lobe pneumonias. And so you look at a whole load of chest x-rays that have a whole lot of left lower lobe pneumonias. Or if you're learning a new language, you're reviewing lots and lots of French verb tenses. Interleave practice is that you are doing or seeing different processes all mixed up. So in radiology, kind of following on with the same examples, you might be reviewing a whole bunch of different pneumonias on a chest X-ray. So not just left lower lobe, different lobes being involved, maybe they're viral, atypical pneumonias, bacterial pneumonias, and so on. And in language study, instead of just doing the verbs, you're doing the verbs and you're doing the vocab. 
And this is a bit more challenging because when you, if you're just looking at a whole load of left load of pneumonias, you know it's a left load of pneumonia before you go in to do it. Or you're doing a bunch of calculations of slopes on graphs. You kind of know the formula you're going to use. You're just applying it to different examples. So with into leave practice, you've actually got to come up with what formula you're going to use, what technique you're going to use. You know, I've got to decide if this is a bacterial pneumonia or a viral pneumonia or an atypical pneumonia before I even work out where it is. Variable practice is sort of similar, but in this case, it's not just sort of what you're looking at being mixed up here, but it's using a different method of practice. And this has been used extensively in sports to improve performance of athletes. So um, coming back to our pneumonia example again, we're not just looking at a bunch of different cases, but perhaps you're answering some multiple choice questions on pneumonia. We're writing a summary about pneumonia and so on. Or for our language example, when we are maybe using some flashcards for our vocab and then we're listening to audio tapes and translating them, we're filling in the blanks on French sentences and so on. And to my mind, although they're separated in terms of educational experiments, both interleaved and variable practice are really overlapping and they're really part of mixed practice as such. I'm just going to show you one example um, from the educational literature. Um, so in this example, um, they took a bunch of people who knew nothing about butterflies and they were divided into a couple of different groups one group got blocked practice. So there were 16 different species of butterfly pictures and they were being shown four example pictures from each species. And they were shown them like this. So for block practice, that group got shown four examples of each species at a time. And the test at the end was 64 examples mixed up of the different 16 species. For the interweave group, they were shown four different species of butterflies on any one slide, um, but overall the groups were shown the same number of pictures of butterflies. And this is what happened when they tested them afterwards. So the group that were shown the interweave pictures, as you can see, got many more right in the final testing. What was probably happening was this, for the interleave groups, when they were shown these pictures that had four different butterfly species at a time, they had to do a compare and contrast exercise, realize that this one had more stripes here, this one had more spots, look very closely at the differences between the Baltimore and the Viceroy and so on. This provided a much stronger learning pattern than if they were just looking at multiple examples of the same butterfly. Here's an example from medical literature, and this was first years learning to read EKGs. So they were either shown had blocked practice, which meant they perhaps looked at a whole bunch of examples of right bundle branch block, and then they moved on to a bunch of examples of left bundle branch block, or their interweave practice, where effectively, again, they were doing a compare and contrast type exercise between the different AKG patterns. And as you can see here, the ones that had the interleave practice did a whole lot better in the final exam. So how might we be able to do this in radiology? Well, I'm a breast imager. And so I might be teaching about breast calcifications. So first of all, I may teach the residents all about ductal carcinoma in situ. And then I show them a series of examples of ductal carcinoma in situ. Then I go on and I teach them about a different type of calcifications, milk of calcium. Then and I go on and I show them multiple examples of milk of calcium. So that would be the blocked or the mass practice model. An interleaved model would be that I show them instead of all of one and then all of another is I interweave and show them perhaps benign, benign malignant microcalcifications and a whole series of this and have them try and work out which is which. Or even better, I show them compare and contrast type exercises. And the important thing here when you're doing this is the contrast. So I could show three different types of linear calcifications and they have to compare the appearance between the different types and work out which one is benign and which one is malignant. And this has been shown to be a very powerful teaching tool. And I like to think about these methods of mixed practice as, as cross-training for your brain. You know, we know cross-training works in sports. Well, it works similarly with the brain. So how might we cross-train in radiology? Well, we can have our residents apply their skills and knowledge in different ways. So 
multiple choice questions is recognition. Case conferences is more generation. Um, ESAT conferences, which are case backwards, where we can give them um, the description of an abnormality and they have to come up with the abnormality. Or uh, we do this with students where we have one student looking at the screen and describing what they're seeing. The other students are facing the rear and they have to get the diagnosis in that. So it also tests their communication skills. But this is both elaboration and generation. We can do compare and contrast exercises, which is interweaving. So cross-training the brain. And coming back to my example of a path through the forest again, what we're doing here is not only making that single path denser and denser, we're adding multiple ways to get at the same information. And this is really important as we want our trainees to go from being novices to masters or experts at a subject. Near transfer of learning is if I was teaching them about left upper lobe collapse as shown here, and they were only able to recognize left upper lobe collapse that looked exactly the same um, as the ones or the, that I was showing. Or if you were teaching uh, medical students to recognize a diagnosis, that they only were able to recognize it if it was if the patient presented in a very similar way with similar demographics to the one that they learned it on. And of course, that's not going to be helpful. What we want them to do is to do far transfer of learning. So we want them to be able to recognize left upper lobe collapse in, you know, whether patients tall or short or thin or obese or um, old or young and partial left upper lobe collapse or complete left upper lobe collapse and so on. Um, and that's far transfer of learning. And that is crucial for developing expertise in a subject. So to finish, I'm just going to come back to um, this number here, which is pi to 500 places. So, you know, while I was researching this talk and I was learning about these memory techniques and I thought it'd be kind of fun to try it out myself um, or try several of the techniques out of myself. So I'm the sort of person who can only remember phone extensions if you say them to me three times. So I thought, well, learning a number, if somewhat useless information would be a good way to test myself. So my challenge was to learn pi to 500 decimal places in both directions. And to do this, I constructed a memory palace. Um, but I also used a bunch of other techniques that we've talked about that I've shown here as part of my um, process. The other qualifier was the only time I had available to do it was on the treadmill. So five mornings a week, 30 minutes each time on the treadmill, I, I was doing this. Um, as part of this, I um, used a technique called the major number system to convert the numbers from 0 to 99 to um, some kind of visual representation. That was my elaboration. And just to kind of like tease you a little bit here, but um, 23 was a gnome and um, uh, 28 was navy because I kind of like guys in uniform. So that was going to be kind of memorable to me. And from those, I built my memory palace. And what that has meant is I have some very strange visual representations of four digit numbers and uh, in the case of my mailbox, five digit number around my house. I'm just going to leave you to imagine the rest of them. These were the ones that were OK for public consumption. Well, what were the results? Uh, it took me five um, days to learn the first hundred image pairs, but then much to my great surprise, um, 100 decimal places of pi took about an hour. And I tested myself the next morning, just learned it one night in bed, um, tested myself the next morning, and I got 98 of them right, which I nearly fell off my treadmill. And then, as you can see here, I learned the others pretty quickly. And once I'd learned it in one direction, you knew it automatically in the other direction. Also very surprised. So in summary, um, if you use these evidence-based learning theories, you can improve the learning efficiency of either your learners or yourself. Um, however, it is clear that some form of testing or self-testing is paramount to make this work. You have to retrieve the information, not just do that repeated review. And introducing some of these desirable difficulties we talked about, again, to improve things. Um, by using specific techniques, such as generation elaboration, or priming and memory cues, and by varying your practice in different ways using that mixed practice models, you can really markedly improve how either your learners um, remember things a long time out or you yourself.
And here's a couple of really interesting books, if anybody uh, wants to. They're both written for the lay public, um, and I think are infinitely more um, understandable than, unfortunately, many of the uh, educational articles out there, but they are all heavily researched. Thank you very much for listening to me.